Good morning. Morning, choir. You know, it reminds me, I, w I went to a meeting on Thursday at about 8 o'clock, and I, I said to one of my technicians, we were going in there, and I said, I think I'll just throw everybody off guard. So I went in there to the conference room, and I said, well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? And they looked at me kind of like you are right now. <laughs> but it's 11 o'clock. So if I do that, and I say, good morning, hey, good morning, how are y'all? There we go, particularly since we're in the Lord's house today, and that is always a great thing. Even though we have things happening in our world, we were reminded of that this weekend with what happened in Charlottesville. We see a lot of stuff going on, and very much similarity, I think, to the days of Elijah, right, Pastor? And Elijah, you know, it's easy to get down about it, because Elijah got down about it, and he said to the Lord, well, I'm the only one left. And what did the Lord do? The Lord reminded him, there are yet 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed the knee nor kissed Baal. And we may feel like we're in the minority, and maybe we are. But look what God does with just a few. A few that the world perceives to be weak. And look what mighty things he does. So what kind of mighty things can he do through us, this body of believers called Lynn Garden Baptist? Let's, let's think about that as we stand up and we sing this morning our first song, which is Days of Elijah. Behold, he comes. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And these are the days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, and the trumpets call. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. And these are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are white in the world, and we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet's call. Until salvation comes. Say it like you mean it. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet's call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. And out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. And the trumpets call, lift your voice. 
get you plumb excited, won't it? I tell you. It should. That's right, Nancy. Oh, it's good to see all of you in God's house today. We welcome you to Lingard Baptist Church. If you're here for the first time, we want to especially welcome you. And we hope that God will bless you uh, by being in this service today. And we hope that you're made to feel welcome uh, today as you are with us. If you are a first-time guest with us, attached to your bulletin is a welcome card. Please take a few moments, fill that out for us, give us a little information about yourself, and we'll have a record, record of your visit with us today. I want to take just a moment to explain to you the insert. We are giving you two weeks' notice on the deacon nomination process. So church members, please be aware you have a list there of current deacons. You will not uh, be able to nominate any of those 12 names. So keep that in mind and that will help you as you pray about who God would want to rotate on our deacon group. And so you have two weeks to be praying about that and maybe as God leads you to uh, a name or two or three or four, up to four names, you will be able to write on your ballot on the 27th. And you can just jot those down, keep them in your Bible, and that way you'll have them with you. But we want to start a week early by giving you heads up, giving you time to pray about that as well. So uh, I told Andy I'd take care of that announcement. He's got enough announcements uh, himself to share with you in just a few min minutes. Let's uh, get started with a word of prayer this morning. Join us at the altar if you're able and willing this morning. Good morning, sweet Jesus. What a blessing it is, Father, to come and to bow in your presence, Lord, recognizing you as our Lord and our Savior. How wonderful it is, Father, to know that your love is everlasting, that you've paid the price for us, Father. You gave your life for our sins so that we'll have eternal salvation. It's the greatest decision, Lord, that anybody will ever make in their life, Father. And I just pray today, this be the day of salvation for anyone not knowing you, Lord. We just turn everything over to you, Lord. We thank you for sending us a comforter, Father, in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, that we might stand along others, Father, in their times of suffering and affliction. And that we can pray and encourage one another and lift them up. People going through different trials, whether it's a loss of someone, whether they're facing cancer, whether they have other trials in their life, Lord. But if we spend our time focused on you, Lord, our troubles are, seem so much smaller. We know, dear God, that you're with us through everything. How wonderful it is to know that, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with our service today. I just pray, Father, that you will encourage and touch the lives of everyone here today, Lord. I know there's so many things on our hearts and minds. But let us truly be thankful, Lord, that if we are alive to be here in your presence today, today what a blessing that is for the next breath that we take. If we had a bed to sleep in last night or if we got up this morning and had a shirt put on our back or if we had a pair of shoes to put on or a meal. Dear God, I'm reminded of a mission team that just got back from Nicaragua. 350 children lined up one behind another to get one meal one day. In reality, we don't have anything to complain about, dear God. We're so blessed. I pray, Father, that you'll be with our nation. Please be with Christians everywhere, Lord. Help us to take a stand for our Lord and our Savior. Thank you for what you've done for us in the past and what you're doing now. And thank you, Father, for preparing that eternal home. 
I pray, Lord, that we can truly stay focused on you and love you with all of our heart and with all of our soul. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing, Great is the Lord, hymn number 12. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory, great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice, praise. everyone. It's good to see everybody on this beautiful Sunday morning. I want to highlight just a couple of announcements for you. This afternoon at 6, our children and our youth, elementary, middle, and high school, and uh, anybody who else would like to join us, uh, we're going to celebrate the uh, surviving the first week of school by going and doing our Bible study at Beach Hut tonight. So bring just a couple dollars for Beach Hut and we'll... Uh, We'll go over there and enjoy and, and have our Bible study for this afternoon. And again, that is going to be for elementary, middle, and high school students this afternoon. Um, I also want to mention that um, Tim is going to have corn here Tuesday at 10 o'clock. He's done this in the past before. It's uh, $4 a dozen, and the proceeds go to the mission trips uh, to Nicaragua that uh, Gail has been involved in, that he's been involved in, and uh, so if you're interested in that, be here at church at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning. And at this time, I want to recognize Jason for an announcement. We had a uh, great response in the in the t-shirts. Uh, I wanted to give you all an update on that. We sold 85 t-shirts, uh, and you all gave the youth $300 towards those shirts. So I want to thank all of y'all very much for doing that. Also, we've had some people that said, well, we didn't have the money or we didn't know that it was the cutoff time when it was. We're going to have one reorder. So for the next two weeks, we're going to have a sign-up sheet again in the, uh, in the hallway next to the office. So you've got two more weeks, and we're going to make one more reorder. Uh, reorder. Also, um, I'd really like to thank Audra. Uh, Audra has, uh, has really, really, really helped in this project. 
And um, I really, really appreciate you doing that, okay? Thank you all. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Audra, for all that you do. This morning, I'd like to ask the children's, uh, children to come up for children's sermon, please. Well, good morning, guys. How are you? How was your first week at school? Good. Did you enjoy? Uh, oh, yeah, Ryan's not started yet, but it's coming. It's coming quickly. So, um, do you, any of you guys have to ask for help this week with something? Carity did. What did you have to ask for help with? Had to ask for help in math this week, yep. I'm right there with you with asking for help with math. That's why I teach literacy. So, so this morning our Bible lesson is about a time when Jesus' disciples needed a helping hand. And it had been a long, hard day for Jesus and his disciples. And as we read about in Matthew chapter 14, this is right after Jesus and the disciples had helped feed more than 5,000 people with only five loaves of bread and two small fish. So Jesus told them to get into a boat and go ahead of him to the other side. And Jesus went up onto the mountain to be alone for a bit and to pray. But later that evening, the wind began to blow, the waves began to bounce their boat around, and shortly before dawn, they saw someone walking on the water out to them. And when the disciples saw him, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they cried. But Jesus spoke to them and said, Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. And Peter spoke up and said, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus answered. Peter climbed out of the boat and started walking on the water towards Jesus. But then he started looking around. And he saw the waves being blown about by the wind. And he started to be afraid. And he started to sink. So this was a time when Peter needed a lot of help. And Jesus reached out his hand and caught Peter. Why did you doubt, Jesus asked. And this is a good lesson to us, guys. Anytime we need help in life, we need just to ask. Ask adults, ask teachers, but ultimately, Jesus is always there. When we pray to him and ask for help, he's ready and willing to answer. It may not always be the answer we expect or the answer we want, but he's always there as our great helper. So let's pray about that before you go to Children's Church. Father God, we are so grateful that Jesus is the ever-present help in our life, that you are always there for us in whatever situation, whatever the need may be. Let us call upon you through prayer and let us be obedient to your word each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's just take a moment to stand up and, and say hello to our neighbors this morning. I told you. I know. And uh, the only thing is, too, I wish that would stay up a little higher. It'll be all right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm a mess. Um,
Now, as uh, you remain standing, let us sing our uh, hymn pr prior to our, what? Yeah, that's right. I had trouble the orange one, too. Our next hymn this morning as we prepare to give to the Lord his tithe and our offering is uh, hymn number 485, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye who are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Whose duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him that overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Father, we're so grateful to be able to come to your house. We come for no other reason but to just to praise your name and to worship you spirited in truth and learn some things, Lord, that might help us as we leave this place to go out into the world every day, that we can be a better Christian and better workers and a better witness for you. But now that we're here, we've come to worship you, Lord, with our tithes and offerings, and we ask that you'll bless the gift and the giver today as, Lord, as we uh, take this money and that we use it for the advancement of your kingdom's work. We praise your name for all you do and all you're going to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
Is this road your traveling? Dark, deserted, and dead. Is there hope for tomorrow? Put your trust in Him. On this glory road I'm traveling. Many times I stumble on my way. But praise the Lord, I'll soon be leaving for the land of perfect peace and endless day. Now I can see, I can see the lights of hope. I can see, I can see him on his throne. I'm too. On this road to glory land Now I can see, I can see The lights of lights hope, hope. I, can see I can see Him on his throne, on his throne. I'm too near I'm too that you are on that road to glory. How do you get on that road? By accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you've not made that decision, I pray that you would listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit draws you to salvation found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to share a message with you today. The devil doesn't want me to share it, but it's called How to Withstand the Attacks of Satan. How to Withstand the Attacks of Satan. We're going to share several scriptures starting with Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10 in that chapter. Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with with the truth, 
and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer, and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your holy word. Lord, I realize today that we're in a war. Lord, it's a spiritual war. And all of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're supposed to be on the front lines, standing for the truth, And Lord, I pray that you would just bless each and every Christian in this place today. I pray, Lord, that maybe they have not been standing as they should have. Lord, I pray that today can be a new beginning for them. I pray, Lord, that they would have a desire to live for you, truly wanting to make a difference in this world for the kingdom of God. And Lord, I pray right now, if there be one in our midst who's never been saved, that Lord, they would let go of all the excuses that Satan's giving them right now as to why today is not a good day. That they might let Jesus Christ have victory in their life. Lord, use me, your servant. Help me, your servant, in sharing this message today. May you receive all glory and praise from everything that is said. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A prayer you and I as Christians should be praying on a daily basis is that God would give us, give us an awareness of Satan's plans and schemes against us. I want to be able to recognize his traps and avoid them. First thing I want us to think about, we need to be aware of how Satan attacks us. Go with me to one verse of scripture in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2 verse 16. We're going to find out in this one verse how Satan attacks us. 1 John 2, verse 16, the Word of God says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now that verse is an outline of Satan's three-pronged attack plan of attack on how he attacks every one of us as Christians. It's the same plan he used when he tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's the same plan he used while tempting Jesus in the desert. First part of his plan involves, the scripture says, the lust of the flesh. God has given all of us certain desires and those desires are good. But the world's invitation is to satisfy those desires sinfully and not in a way that pleases God. Hunger and eating is not evil, but gluttony is a sin. Thirst is not evil, but drunkenness is sin. Sleep is a gift from God, but laziness is sinful. Sex is God's gift to a man and woman living within the bonds of marriage, but sex outside of marriage is sinful. Second part of his plan, it says, involves the lust of the eyes. These are desires centered around wanting to have things that you see. Having material things is not wrong, but greed and coveting are sinful. It was his eyes that led David to lie, commit adultery, and murder. Achan brought defeat to Joshua's army because he coveted what he saw with his eyes and took what God had strictly forbidden. Satan tempted Eve by drawing her attention, Genesis 3, 6 says, to what was pleasant to the eyes. 
Then this third part of his plan, that verse says, involves the pride of life. The pride of life is the desire to have to do, outdo, to outdo the other person. The desire to have to outdo the other person. Think about what it's saying right here. To be better than everybody else. The pride of life speaks of the person who boasts of themselves rather than God. Why is it so many folks buy houses, vehicles, or wardrobes they really cannot afford? Largely because they feel a need to impress people. The pride of life. Then the second thing I want us to think about is Jesus Christ has all authority and power over Satan. The first scripture I want you to think about in this regard is Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. And in this verse the Apostle Paul is speaking of Jesus. That verse reads, For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. Now notice that phrase Paul wrote there, all things were created by Him and for Him. And that includes the angels. Now here's the connection. God created the angelic kingdom. And Satan, or Lucifer, is an angel who rebelled against God and sought to place himself upon God's throne. But because God is all-powerful, Lucifer failed. So we read in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 where Lucifer was cast out of heaven along with many other fallen angels. Now we may call them fallen angels, but the Bible much more often calls them demons or evil spirits. And with them, Satan established his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. Now I believe exactly what the Bible says about demons. It is too much a part of the New Testament to be ignored, too much a part of the ministry of Jesus to just shove it to the side. So when demons are referred to in the Bible, we need to realize that God's Word is speaking about actual spiritual forces of evil in our world. But we need also to understand the authority and power that our Savior, Jesus Christ, has over them. That passage, that verse in Colossians is saying that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, were all involved in the creation. And they created all things, and therefore Christ has absolute authority over all things, even the angels and demons of the kingdom of Satan. Now turn with me, give you an example, to the story of the Gadarene demoniac found in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 5, we're going to look at several verses, verses 6 through 13. A little background, Jesus and the disciples sail across the Sea of Galilee to Gadaria where there's a man possessed by demons, the scripture plainly says, He's been living among the tombs. He's been banished from his community. He's in isolation, if you will. And he shouts and screams all the time like a wild animal. The people have tried to contain him using chains. But nothing is strong enough to restrain him. And then Jesus and the disciples come ashore. Mark chapter 5, and we're going to start at verse 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee. Adjure means I beg you. 
by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. <clears throat> and he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. It's a weird story, isn't it? And there are some things about that we may not fully understand, but here's what I want you to see. Lots of demons possessed this one man. So many that when Jesus cast him out of this man, Scripture says 2,000 went into this herd of pigs. They begged permission of Jesus that he would not send them out of the area. And Jesus gave them permission. Jesus had absolute authority over these demons. Now turn back, still in the book of Mark, to chapter 1. Two verses right here. For Jesus is teaching in the synagogue of Capernaum. In chapter 1 of Mark, verses 23 and 25. <clears throat> and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Isn't it interesting that this evil spirit recognized Jesus? No introduction, but instantly he recognized who Jesus was. Why would he ask the question, are you come to destroy us? If Jesus did not have the power to destroy them. Jesus has absolute authority, my friends. The forces of evil recognize the authority and power of Christ over them. In the New Testament, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 19, we find something else that's very interesting. The Word of God says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe. Why do they tremble? Why do they shudder? Because they fear the judgment that is coming. They shudder in the presence of Christ because of His authority and power over them. I'm afraid sometimes that the demons show more concern about the authority and power of God than most of us do. Amen. Most of us do not shudder in the presence of God. Most of us do not stand in awe of the power of God. Most of us take God and His holy word for granted and we just kind of drift and coast along through life doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, the way we want to do it, thinking everything will always be alright because I'm, I'm a Christian. Never really realizing the seriousness of the enemy that we are dealing with here, my friend. And that leads me to the third thing. How can you resist and defeat Satan? We read from Ephesians 6. And whether we realize it or not, we face a powerful enemy whose goal is to defeat Christ's church. Why does Paul tell us in this writing, in Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God? Well, he tells us two different times in that passage. In verse 13, he says this, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. That verse describes our current situation. That phrase, evil day, 
It's when Satan is attacking you on a certain day from all angles. You ever had one of those days? When it just seemed like Satan had unleashed the forces of hell against you that day. That is an evil day for you. But I think an evil day is upon us as a nation as well. As Christians, my friends, we have the armor of God available to us that God's word commands us to put on every day. We are called to stand our ground and fight and still be standing when the day is done. God does not allow for you and me to go and sit down and let somebody else fight. God wants us to stand and still be standing when the day is done. Everything we need to live for Christ is available to us. The Holy Spirit indwells you and me as Christians. God says, put on this armor that you can withstand the attacks of Satan. Can I be honest with you? Living the Christian life is one of the hardest things you will ever attempt to do. Don't you believe anybody who tells you if you're a Christian, things should be easy. That's a lie from hell. Is it not difficult sometimes to get yourself up and get to church? Maybe it's just in the Mead household, but sometimes our biggest struggles are on Sunday morning. Especially when the kids were at home. Oh my, we had some good arguments on the way to church. But some days it's difficult, isn't it, to open up your Bibles and read the Word of God. Some days it's very difficult to have some quality time in prayer with God. Sometimes it's difficult to give your tithe to God. Sometimes it's difficult to keep your thoughts pure and to keep your eyes on what is good. Living the Christian life is one of the most difficult things you will do. Have you ever wondered why? The answer is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. You see, Satan doesn't bother the lost person that much. He's got them. Until they start thinking about maybe accepting Christ, then he jumps in. But you see, as a Christian, he can't touch our soul, but he says, I can make you miserable. I can, I can make you feel frustrated. I can make you feel like you just want to quit. And that's his goal, that we sit down instead of standing for God. The Christian life is hard to live because of spiritual warfare. Christian families and marriages are under attack today. Children are under attack today. Churches are under attack. Pastors and church leaders are under attack. Even the Bible is under attack. All because of spiritual warfare. Now here in Ephesians 6, God's word is telling us how to get ready for battle. Why is this such a big deal? Because we're living, I believe, in the last days. And Satan knows it. 2 Timothy 3.1 tells us that in the last days, perilous times will come. You know what perilous times are? Dangerous and violent. Oh my, just look at the news. Dangerous and violent times will be prevalent in the day and time in which you're living prior to the second coming. Satan, I believe, has redoubled his efforts knowing his time is short. Sin has always been with us, I know that. And Satan has always been active, but in the 21st century, particularly of America, we have openly rejected God and His Holy Word. When you turn from God, the only thing left is the worship of idols of your own making. You and I were created to worship. We will worship someone, we will worship something. 
we are seeing evil and immorality grow because our society has rejected the Word of God. Now I want to give you an, an important verse. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. And I want you to look at this and think about the day and time in which we're living. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. He's describing a mixed up people, a mixed up nation. That's us today, I'm telling you, friends. The attacks on the institution of marriage as defined by God and this transgender debate we're having in our nation at this time are but two examples of what I'm talking about. Some individuals are being deceived by Satan himself. For a Christian, there should be no debate about it whatsoever. What I believe and what you believe as a Christian must be filtered through the Word of God. And if what we hear out here in the world contradicts the Word of God, you better run from it. You better stay to the truth that you find in the Word of God. God's Word, God Himself in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He him. Male and female created He them. Jesus quoted those same words in Matthew chapter 19 verse 4. God the creator and sustainer of human life has determined how many sexes there are. There's two and only two my friends, male and female. To say the sex a person was born with was not God's divine plan for that individual is rebellion against God himself. And God will judge a nation that calls that good. You see why Isaiah 5.20 is such a relevant verse for us? But listen to me, church. Just as Jesus went out of his way in the day and time when he walked on this earth to share his love with the outcast of society, you and I are called to humbly share his love as revealed in the gospel to lift people up who are struggling, who are under attack by Satan, to lift them up in prayer and to allow for the Holy Spirit to bring about conviction, healing, and transformation. I would welcome any of those people who are caught up in this confusion of homosexuality and this transgender, I would welcome them to sit in these pews and be under the sound of the gospel. That's what they need. They need to know Jesus loves them. And Jesus is the only one, my friend, who can bring about that transformation needed in their life. Satan is active, though, and he's on a rampage today because society has rejected God and embraced evil in radical ways. When evil abounds, you can be certain that Satan is having a field day. It's easy to look at the world today and think that our enemies are certain politicians or certain entertainers or even terrorists. When we see people standing in opposition to our beliefs, to our morals, when we see people standing against our Christian values, it's easy to say, there's our enemy. But now look at our text in Ephesians 6 at verse 12. That's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You see, in Paul's day, the Roman Emperor Nero instigated a persecution of Christians across the empire. That, My friends, my human mind cannot even imagine what that man ordered to be done to Christians. History bears record that Christians were burned alive, dipped in wax, and burned. Christians were thrown in the lion's den. Christians were beheaded. All at the orders of this emperor. 
listen to me, Nero was not the enemy. That's what God's Word says. As evil as he was, Nero was just a tool of the real enemy, Satan, and the forces of wickedness in the spiritual realm. What is the armor of God? Verses 14 through 17 there in Ephesians 6 answers that question. The armor has six parts. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This armor reminds us that our hope for victory rests in God and God alone. Behind the belt of truth stands the God of truth. Behind the breastplate of righteousness stands the God of righteousness. Behind the shoes of the gospel of peace stands the God of peace. Behind the shield of faith stands the God who is faithful. Behind the helmet of salvation stands the God of salvation. Behind the word of God stands the God of the word. We do not fight alone or in our own power. When we take up the divine armor, God himself fights for us. So why is it important that every day we put on this spiritual armor? Again, go back to our text, verse 11 and verse 13. Verse 11 tells us that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Supernatural enemies require supernatural resources to defeat them. No one said being a Christian is easy. In fact, Jesus said, if they hate me, they will hate you. Jesus himself said that. Anyone who says otherwise are false teachers and are dangerous. When you signed up for Team Jesus, you joined the Lord's army. And there's good news and bad news there. The bad news is being a Christian does not give you a break from the battle. We are under attack 24-7, 365 days a year. Why is that? Because Satan doesn't sleep. The forces of darkness do not sleep. We don't have the luxury of going to sleep spiritually. But here's the good news. God has provided everything necessary so we can face and defeat Satan in every attack that he makes against us. The last phrase there in that verse, and having done all to stand, pictures a soldier still standing in the middle of a battlefield after the conflict has ended. It's been a long, hard, brutal fight. Many casualties, many wounded, many fallen. But he or she is still standing. Jesus won the greatest battle. When he died on the cross, and on that third day he arose from that grave. God wants each and every one of us as Christians to experience victory over Satan when he attacks. But that won't happen without a fight. The Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. Christianity is not for those who want to run and hide. It's a religion for strong men and brave women. The evil day may be upon us, my friends, but I am not a pessimist. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Are you standing? I'm speaking to Christians right now. Are you standing? Maybe you've had your skirmishes and battles with Satan even this last week. But you're here. Maybe you have sit there. Maybe you've been sitting for some time. And God's Holy Spirit has reminded you, you need to get back in the battle. And make a difference for the kingdom of God. The great thing about our God, He's a God of second chances. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're here today and you've not been saved, 
You're not even in the battle yet. But you're in the most dangerous position of all. Because Satan would want you to think there's plenty of time. I don't agree with any of the things that went on in Charlottesville. But I do think about that one that was in that crowd when that car ran through and one lost their life. Now I doubt when they showed up for that protest that they ever thought this is my last time on earth. You never know. Satan would want you to think You've got your whole life ahead of you to make that decision. Not now. You know what I used to say as a young person before I gave my heart and life to Jesus? I'd look around church. There's too many here today. I'll do it next time. And I I realized that was Satan. That was Satan trying to get me to put it off, put it off, put it off. And you know if something would have happened to me before I finally gave my heart and life to Jesus, I would have gone to hell. Spiritual warfare. Are you in the battle? Are you standing? Bow your head with me. Father, in this time of our service, Lord, when decisions are made, we pray that your will be done. I pray, Lord, if there's one person here today, Lord, that you're speaking to, that, Lord, they'd have the courage to step out from that pew and find their way to this altar this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. is open my eyes that I may see and let that be our prayer this morning